Welcome to Google Cloud On Air. In this session, we'll be talking about high availability and disaster recovery with Cloud SQL. My name is Brett Hesterberg. I'm a product manager working on Cloud SQL. And while we can't see each other today, I do hope to learn a little bit about you as part of this talk. If you're comfortable doing so, please use your chat window or your question window to let me know your job title. Are you a DBA, a reluctant DBA, DevOps engineer, developer, or something else? And which relational database you use most often? Is it MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, PostgreSQL, Sybase, DB2, SQLite, or something else? Hopefully we can still get a chance to get to know each other a little bit. And as a note, I'll be available as part of Google Cloud Next expert sessions if you would like to meet with me about Cloud SQL. Today, we're gonna to be talking about concepts related to high availability and disaster recovery. We'll start off a little bit with the concepts themselves and go over some terminology. From there, we'll talk about how we protect against user error and then get into how we might achieve high availability, especially with Cloud SQL. And lastly, we'll round out with what to do when we have a disaster. How do we recover? So to start, I'll give a little bit of information about Cloud SQL itself. Cloud SQL is a managed database service that offers MySQL, PostgreSQL, and SQL Server. This means that if your application works with MySQL, SQL Server, or PostgreSQL, it works with Cloud SQL. Compatibility is at our core, and we focus on managing the mundane aspects of database administration. When I think about database administration and what it takes to run a database, this tends to be the diagram that I think of. In the left-hand column, or the leftmost column, we see server maintenance, racking stacking servers, HVAC, networking power, things related to managing a data center or managing a server environment, the hardware itself. Of course, in the cloud, this is taken care of for you. And in Cloud SQL, with our SQL instances, we ensure that when you configure a number of vCPUs and some RAM, that you get a consistent instance, regardless of as to what's happening with your underlying hardware. We make sure that that instance continues forward, even when we have hardware changes going on. Looking a little further to the right on the slide, we see the column that, that talks about the operating system. And this includes installing the operating system, as well as patching it and keeping it up to date. Right, one more from there, finally we get to the database itself, where we're installing the database, we're keeping it patched and up to date. And lastly, we're thinking about protecting our data with a set of backups. Finally, on the slide rightmost, we get into high availability, usually using replication and some health checking to perhaps perform automatic failover in the, in the event we have an incident or an outage, and also scaling, thinking about things like uh, using replication to scale out reads, for example. We wrap this entire technology stack in monitoring so that if there is a problem, we're able to understand where the root cause is, and Cloud SQL's job here is to take this, what is usually a, a complex technology stack, and wrap it in an API and a UI so that your developers or your application teams are able to easily turn up a dev or test database, or even a much more complex production database, which includes automatic failover for high, avail for high availability, built-in backups for data protection, and near real-time copies of data in other regions in case of a regional failure or an actual disaster. Our customer, Tim Kelton at Descartes Labs, I think sums this up pretty well. He says for his team, Cloud SQL gives him more time to work on the products that provide value to their customers. What Tim is saying is they would rather spend time on products that are meaningful to their customers than on the mundane aspects of database administration. And Tim's team uses Cloud SQL to help offset that time. One thing that we should note is that Cloud SQL is backed by a 24 by seven SRE team, Site Reliability Engineering Team. This is the team that writes the automation to make sure our databases are healthy, our service runs well. And in the event of a problem that can't be solved by automation, they're the folks who get hands on keyboard to bring a database back to life. As we talk about high availability and disaster recovery, it's important to start with a little bit of terminology. To begin, We'll talk about backups. Backups are independent copies of the data set that isn't in the database serving path. This means we think about the database's data set, the data it's working on right now. We usually make a copy of it, an independent copy sent to some other storage system so that that backup is no longer in the serving path or the place where the database is making changes to the primary data set. In Cloud SQL, we offer automated backups, which means 
We take them daily, for example, at a time that you set. We also offer on-demand or manual backups where you can tell us to take a backup and we'll take it in that moment. Going beyond backups, we get to point-in-time recovery. Point-in-time recovery is functionality that often uses backups to restore to a very granular point in time, down to, for example, the millisecond. As part of point-in-time recovery, usually we keep transaction logs, which contain a list or a log of all transactions the database has been running, all the inserts, updates, etc., so that we can go back to very granular points in time, uh, specific moments when a transaction was run, for example. Also on the list is replication. Replication is a continuous copy of data from your source or your primary database to a replica or a secondary database. This means that we are making sure we have either a real-time or a near real-time copy of data in some other database from your primary. Replication has two major options. One is synchronous, the other is asynchronous. In a synchronous replication model, a transaction is not fully committed or is not responded to by the primary instance to a client until both the primary database instance and its replica have committed the transaction. The primary instance will wait for the replica to ensure that both have committed the transaction before it responds to the client saying, your transaction has now been committed. In asynchronous replication, the primary instance doesn't wait for the replica. In this case, the primary instance simply commits the transaction and without waiting for the replica to let it know that it too committed the transaction, it responds to the client saying, your, your transaction has been committed. We'll talk about how Cloud SQL uses both of these as, as part of its availability and disaster recovery protection mechanisms. The last two terms that we'll go over here are recovery point objective and recovery time objective. Recovery point objective is the maximum time period in which we might lose data from our system due to an incident. Spoken plainly, this means that when we take a backup right now, we allow the database to continue to run. So our backup in this very moment has the exact data set our database does. We have a full copy, an independent copy of, to, of the data set from right now. But the database continues to perform inserts and updates, changing the data set subsequent to our backup. Now there's data in the database that we don't have in our backup. If we were to have an incident losing our database right now, we would lose all of the transactions that, that were committed after we took our backup. When we talk about a recovery point objective, we're setting an objective which states we are only wanting to lose a particular amount of data. So for example, if our RPO were five minutes, we would ensure that we have a data protection mechanism in place such that we would not lose more than five minutes of transactions, for example, from one backup to the next. This is depicted in the diagram on the slide as a backup, which is point one, and then an incident happening roughly in the middle of the diagram. The difference or the timeline between the backup and the incident is it helps us define our recovery point objective, effectively quantifies how much data we've lost in that incident. Recovery time objective is the targeted duration uh, of time that we allow to recover the data that has um, previously been backed up. What this means is in the event of an incident, and we want, when we want to use one of our data protection mechanisms to recover data, we measure the amount of time it takes to perform the recovery from the backup, as an example, and get the database back up and running. That amount of time is known as our recovery time. And we set an objective which states how much time we will allow for that process to happen. In a critical database system, usually the RPO, recovery point objective, and RTO are pretty small values. Recovery point objective perhaps measured in seconds and recovery time objective perhaps measured in minutes. In less critical systems or non-critical databases, these objectives may be much more lenient with recovery point objectives being much larger and recovery time objectives being longer where we're allowing more data loss and more recovery time. And we define how we protect data, the mechanisms we use, the number of protections we put in place to try to adhere to our RPO and our RTO. Let's talk about protecting against user error. In presentations like these, often we talk mostly about disasters and we depict them with lightning bolts or fire on the slides. In reality, much more common that human error is the culprit of data loss. We ourselves, in some sense, are the disaster. Perhaps I make a mistake, I drop a table, I change a row, 
and I didn't mean to. I want to get back in time. I want to undo that change. And I may not know, by the way, that I made a mistake for a couple hours, for example. How do we protect against that kind of user error, which is far more common in enterprise IT environments or any IT environment? With Cloud SQL, I talked about using backups. And Cloud SQL, as mentioned, offers both automated backups as well as on-demand backups. In the screenshot, we show a user configuring automated backups, where the user is setting a time when we take a backup automatically via Cloud SQL once per day. With these backups, it's important to note that these are storage level or block level backups so that we are minimizing the amount of data that we are tracking between backups or that we are saving to another system. If we take a backup at this moment, we watch and track the number of block changes to the next time we take a backup, which means the size of backups, a common question from customers is, how large will my backups be? It is more dependent on how busy or active your database is than on how frequently you take these backups. For example, a very active database will generate quite large backup files, lots of block changes from one backup to the next. Whereas a largely inactive database won't generate many changes between backups. And even if we take backups quite frequently, they might be very small. You can imagine a database not doing any work right now if we take a, if we take a backup and wait a few seconds and then take another one. The second backup may be extremely small because we didn't have any subsequent block changes between the backups. How can we do a little better than backups? If we're taking backups each day, that might mean we have a recovery point objective of roughly 24 hours, where our worst case is that if we take a backup yesterday at 11 p.m., we have a problem today at 10.59 p.m., almost exactly 24 hours since our last backup, but about a minute before we take the next backup. How can we do better than this? This is where point-in-time recovery comes into play. As I mentioned, point-in-time recovery builds upon backups or uses backups usually as part of the recovery mechanism. Here we're showing a screenshot of setting up or rather recovering using point-in-time recovery in Cloud SQL. What you see here is that we're using a timestamp-based point-in-time. Here we're selecting down to the millisecond when we want to recover to in, in the past. Cloud SQL offers transaction or timestamp-based recovery with point-in-time recovery back seven days. So it allows me to pick a millisecond in any of the last seven days to which I want to recover to. This means if I've made a mistake, as I described earlier, I might want to go to the millisecond or even the second before I made that mistake. And in this example, we're cloning or copying a database to that point. So I can go back and get that data, bring it back into my primary database, effectively undoing the mistake that I made. With backup protections or data protections rather in mind, let's now take a look at how to achieve high availability. As a starting point, you all have worked in IT environments for a long time, and you know that high availability is not easy to achieve. It usually involves some combination of replication, health checking, and then some workflow management in case we want to automatically fail over in the event of an incident. With high availability, we usually begin by talking about data redundancy. High availability often relies on writing data to two or more places so that in case of an incident with our primary database instance, we have the data elsewhere and are quickly able to make it available to recover from that incident. This type of configuration is sometimes called a cluster. It simply means we're using two or more database servers to perform the tasks that one could perform so that we have redundancy in case of an, in of, in case of an incident. For Cloud SQL, it's important to note that the high availability configuration is required for SLA coverage. Our service level agreement, or SLA, guarantees a particular uptime. And as part of that SLA, we require that high availability is enabled so that we can automatically and quickly recover from any incident that may affect your database instance. When we talk about high availability in Cloud SQL, this is conceptually what it looks like. When the high availability configuration is enabled, we create a primary instance in a zone and a standby instance in another zone. In this example, we've created a primary instance in zone A and a standby instance in zone B. This ensures that we have redundancy in our HA configuration such that if there's a problem in zone A, we have a place to fail over to and an instance that we can bring up quickly to recover and be back online for our client. Also shown in the, in the diagram is that we're writing data to two places at once. We're using a regional persistent disk, which synchronously replicates data in both zones, in this case, zone A and zone B. So before the primary database instance, 
will confirm to a client that a transaction has been committed, it ensures that the data has been written to both zones when our system is, is operating normally. This means that we can reliably fail over to our standby zone knowing we have a full copy of the data set and every last committed transaction will be present when we bring the database back online. In case of an outage, Cloud SQL does a number of things from a workflow perspective. Most important to note is that we move the IP address and the name of the primary instance to the standby instance. This is important because an application then need not know about the failover itself. It only has to try to reconnect because the IP address doesn't change. To the application, it simply looks like the database has gone down and then has come back up. And by retrying, the application can reconnect and begin serving traffic just after the failover. To get used to or to get comfortable with Cloud SQL's high availability configuration, I recommend that you get hands-on. You can check it out for yourself in the product and you can initiate a failover in the UI. You'll see a failover button or via our API. You can also take a look at our code labs. We have a code lab, lab in particular that features Kubernetes Engine and Cloud SQL. It talks about how you can build a fault tolerant application where in the lab you will, you will test fault tolerance both in the application layer, Kubernetes Engine, as well as in Cloud SQL. Lastly, I encourage you to check out this showcase that we've created for Google Cloud Next 2020. This showcase is essentially a whack-a-mole of databases where you can see how many times you can make Cloud SQL fail and how many times it recovers by kind of whack-a-mole style, taking down a database perhaps in zone A and seeing it pop back up in zone B. The link is shown in the slide and I encourage you to take a look. Let's round out with a look at recovering in case of a large disaster. And here, you and your careers have likely spent a lot of time planning and even testing for large disasters. Hopefully you haven't faced many real ones. In Google terms, when we think of a disaster, we tend to think of this as a regional outage, where a, regional is a region is comprised of usually three or more zones, independent failure domains. And this would mean something has happened such that all the zones or enough of the zones in a region are down that the region does not have connectivity. It is totally down. As you can imagine, this has significant consequences as any disaster would. When you're doing your disaster recovery planning, you're imagining usually that most of the applications, if not all, that serve your internal users and your external customers may be down. And in that moment, the job is to make sure that we can recover quickly and perform the recovery such that we lose a minimum set of data. A stressful moment to be sure. Let's look at how Cloud SQL has tried to make this a little easier. We've introduced cross-region replication to help guard against regional failure. It allows you to have a near real-time copy via a replica in one or more regions outside of your primary region. We're relying on Google's network, including Google Cloud VPC or virtual networks, so that you have a very private way to connect between your primary instance and its replicas in other regions. Further, because Google's VPCs are global, there's very minimal network configuration for you to perform here. A Google VPC spans all regions in, in the cloud network, all of the regions you're using, which makes this very easy to use and to configure. In fact, you see in the screenshot here highlighted, all we're doing is selecting a region other than our primary region when we're creating a replica. And we can be certain that the replica is being spun up in another region and we're connecting from our primary to our replica in a very secure fashion over our private network. With the replica now deployed in another region, let's look at what's ap actually happening behind the scenes. In this diagram, you see a high availability configuration in a primary region, in this case, US Central 1. Here again, we're using synchronous replication within the region to ensure that we can automatically fail over without losing committed transactions. Between regions or outside of the primary region to your replicas, we're using asynchronous replication. As you recall from our terminology section, asynchronous replication means the primary instance is not waiting for the replicas to commit their transactions before it tells the client the transaction has been committed. We do that because the latency can be higher between regions given the geographic distance between them. We don't want to harm performance in the primary region by waiting for every replica around the world to say, I also have committed the transaction. And so we replicate asynchronously. This has ramifications for your recovery point objective. 
it means that you can potentially have replication lag, usually on the order of seconds, but your replica doesn't have the exact real-time copy of the data set the primary has. It has a near real-time copy, something that's perhaps a few seconds in the past from what has now happened on the primary instance. Bear this in mind, especially in your disaster recovery planning. In this diagram, though, we see two replicas. Again, these could be in any regions in the world, even in separate regions, allowing us to ensure that we have a very near real-time copy of data elsewhere. And that allows us from an RTO perspective, recovery time objective perspective, in case of a regional outage of our primary region, to offer roughly a one to three minute recovery time where we can promote these replicas to become read and writable to serve application traffic in the event of an outage. It allows you to build a database configuration that adheres to fairly strict RPO and RTO objectives or recovery time objectives rather in case of a widespread or regional outage. One thing to note here is the replicas themselves are always readable. So you are able not only to see which data has landed on your replicas, but if you have use cases such as reporting, or maybe you just wanna offer lower latency reads to users in other parts of the world, cross-region replicas are a good way to go to accomplish that. To wrap up here, we wanna recommend that for especially critical systems in your environment with Cloud SQL, you enable automatic daily backups and point-in-time recovery for very granular or millisecond level recovery. You should also consider taking more frequent on-demand backups. These can be useful if you're making, for example, a schema change. You may want to take an on-demand backup just before you make the schema change. Of course, point-in-time recovery can be used to perform that restoration as well, but it never hurts to take an additional backup, especially when you know you're going to be making a big change. Next, we encourage you to enable in-region high availability, our synchronous replication model. So the Cloud SQL can health check your instances, can automatically fail over in the event of an incident, and make sure that you're back online without any intervention. And lastly, consider using in-region, or more importantly, cross-region replication, which is asynchronous replication, to make sure you have a near real-time copy of your data in another region than where your primary instance resides. That way, in case of a regional failure or disaster, you have a near real-time copy of data that can be made accessible quite rapidly, adhering to a fairly strict RTO. With that, I encourage you to tune in to two additional sessions, first being data modernization, which is McKesson's story of their migration to cloud, and then take a look at our bare, bare metal solution, which helps you bring your enterprise workloads to GCP. If you want to see the showcase that I mentioned in action, please follow this link and play our whack-a-mole style high availability uh, demo. Lastly, try it out for yourself. Get hands-on with Cloud SQL by following our Quick Lab quest you'll be introduced to a number of Cloud SQL's capabilities, including those that I mentioned today. And by the end, you'll be quite familiar with Cloud SQL. With that, I want to thank you for joining me today for this session. As mentioned, I'm available for expert sessions as part of Google Cloud Next 2020, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you.